Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Gospel Life. I want to invite you to stand. We are going to worship God together this morning.
everybody how's everyone doing looks like most of you have found your way to your seats you guys know the drill I'm so proud of you all some mornings it's hard it's sleepy and you just find yourself wandering but we're glad that you wandered and found yourself here sorry just bad jokes today it's a, it's okay they didn't have much announcements and I just like filling the time so 
I'm so glad that you came and joined us this morning. My name's Ben, um, and welcome to Gospel Life Church. We're so thankful that you joined us this morning. We are all about helping people take their next steps with Jesus. If you haven't been here before or haven't gotten to stop by, we've got a table out in the lobby called Take Five, and that's where we just want to take five minutes just to get to know you a little bit better. It's a great way to like hear a little bit more about our church, see how you can get involved in serving, hear a little bit more about what we're doing um, and how we're reaching this community around us. So I just encourage you, stop by that Take Five table, and we'd just love to get to know you a little bit better. Also, we have a wonderful, I at least my favorite event coming up that comes every month, and that is the men's breakfast. And so if you have not gotten to stop by that, it's every third Saturday at 8 a.m. As I've gotten older, that doesn't feel as early as it did before. And so I, I'm just going to start speaking it into existence. That That's really not that early. Like, that's a sleep-in day. And so I... Make sure that you're getting there for it. It's going to be a great time. There's always so much food. So if nothing else, that's a great way. But also you are filled by the relationships and the encouragement that happens there. Um, Also, I don't know if you guys have been keeping up. We're on month number four of our memory verses. And so we're going to go ahead and read this one. This month we're going to be doing Romans 8.1. And so it should be up on the screen behind me. Um, oh, and we'll do, I think it's the pause at, com- I guess there aren't really commas, so we're just going to read it, sorry. <laughs> Tay, I was trying so hard. <laughs> All right. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Romans 8.1. What a good reminder, guys. Did, did you hear those words in there? There's now no condemnation for us who are in Christ Jesus. I, I at least feel like that's an encouragement for the week. And so, as I would just encourage you guys, make sure that you're keeping up on those verses. Commit them to memory because that's what really helps fuel us throughout the week and really keeps us centered on what Christ is all about. And so, we are just so thankful. Again, I, I love seeing all of your guys' faces up here, whether you're coming and attending, whether I get to shake your hands, those who are serving down in kids' ministry or back in the tech or on worship team up here, or just however you're getting involved, we are just so thankful for all of you that are here and all that you bring. Um, and so if you guys would just bow your heads in prayer with me as we continue on in worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we are just so thankful for you. Lord, this is all for you. This is not an opportunity to socialize, even though we are blessed with that. Lord, it's not an opportunity to figure out lunch plans afterwards, although we can do that. Lord, this is about you. This is about worshiping you. This is about getting to know you better. And so, Lord, I just pray that our hearts would be ready for that. Lord, that we would be seeking after something that will transform our lives, that will change us and transform us into someone who is a better representative for you in your kingdom. Lord, we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Ben. This is why I preach, because I can do the announcements as well as our brother uh, and does. So as Ben said, good morning. It is good to see you. And this is another week where we have another uh, baptism in the house and super exciting to you. Amen. Come on, let's celebrate that. Ben, I love that because it goes back to that verse in Jesus Christ. We're no longer condemned, but we are welcomed. We are loved. God calls us his children. And when we say yes to them, he invites us into this life giving relationship that changes us forever. And that's the beauty of baptism, right? It's the outward expression of inward change, is that our hearts have been changed and our minds have been changed. We're going to preach about today is now we want to be a living sacrifice for our King Jesus. And so uh, the water doesn't save you. It is confessing with your mouth, believing in your heart, as the scripture says, that Jesus Christ is the Lord, and then you invite him in to be your Lord and Savior. So uh, today we have a student going to be in the water, and so uh, how about Pastor Daniel do the baptizing today with uh, one of the small group leaders? Hello, Carol Stream. How's everyone doing this morning? 
Okay, okay. I love it. Um, it's been a joy to witness God moving in our student ministry. What's really cool is that um, in, from the year of 2024, every single month we have been baptizing a student. So this is the fourth month in a row. All right, yeah, give it up for that. This is my friend Caleb. He's a little nervous, but, you know, I said you guys are really nice Caleb. people, so he's not going to be nervous. Yeah. One of the twin brother, right? And he went to St. Louis with me two weeks ago. Was it fun? Yes. Okay. Are you sure? You don't sound like you had fun. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Anyways, um, we're going to have, we're going to baptize Caleb. We've been hanging out for two years, and it's going to be a great moment for you. So I'm going to ask you three questions, all right? Do you believe that Jesus Christ died on the cross and rose from the grave? Yes. Now, by faith, you trust Jesus Christ as your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Now tell us why do you want to be baptized? Um, when we went on the St. Louis um, mission trip, I think God was really pushing me to take my next step. Step, and um, I think baptism, baptism was the next step for me. Wow! Amen. Let's go. I'm here with one of our interns. He's also Caleb's small group leader. We're here to baptize you. Hey, brother! It's my honor to um, baptize you in the name of Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Thank you, Pastor Daniel, and the work of the ministry that is going on. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, thank you by faith. We can trust in you, not by anything we can do, no good merit, no good deeds, no fame, no fortune, but by faith in Christ Jesus. Lord, thank you for ministries that are life-changing. We're small group leaders and pastors and, and peers pour into our lives with the word of God, but also through action to push us closer to you. Thank you for the body. And so, Lord, I pray for Caleb, his next steps in growing in you. Thank you for his godly family who's, who's uh, training him in the way of truth. And I just pray you be with him. As a young man, there's so many things, Lord, that can grab his attention and his desires. And may Jesus be the focus all that he do. May his church come alongside of him and cheer him on and spur him on to things of God. I praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand as we continue in worship.
yes, Lord, the, the world will not satisfy, the flesh will not satisfy, whatever the devil throws before us will not satisfy, only you will. Jesus, you are the one who is enough, who came back from the dead to give us new life. And in that new life, we stand and we operate and we move and have our being. And Lord, you're here in this place. And what we need to do more than anything is remind ourselves of the truths we already know. And that is that you are our foundation. You are the center of our life. Lord, may we not be like the Jewish leaders who stumbled over the stumbling stone, but rather embracing Christ as the cornerstone. Father, we are here to reorient ourselves, to surrender again before you, our Lord and our Master. You are so good to us. Thank you for being our all in all. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 You may be seated, church. You may be seated. Thank you, worship team, for leading us in songs of worship. Well, Greaves, it's a good day for you. Good to see your son taking his step of faith. I've known your family for a long time, and thanks, Mom and Dad, for putting your boys before Jesus, and seeing it bear fruit today is a, is a powerful reminder. So thank you for walking before Jesus so faithfully for your boys. Well, good morning. My name's Austin. Serve as one of the pastors here at Gospel Life. It's a privilege and honor to be with you all this morning. Uh, we're going to turn in the scriptures to Romans. We're going to head back into our series in the book of Romans, and uh, head back to our book three. So if you'll turn to Romans chapter 12 with me, we will start the sermon today. Romans 12, the section of scripture that we're going to be seeing for the next several weeks is how the gospel impacts my everyday relationships. Um, if the first segment of Romans was about my relationship with God and how I have life in Him. This next section is about how does that faith now live out in community with other people, with those that know me and see me the best. And I want to start by just asking a question. Who's the godliest person you know? Who's that person who, when you're around them, there's this ethos, this aura about them. Like you, you know this person has been with God. Yesterday, I was at a conference in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is where the home place of Billy Graham. And uh, Billy Graham on Time Magazine, once he passed, was known as America's Preacher. For decades, he traveled all across the world to share the message of hope in the gospel. Some would argue he would be maybe the godliest person out there. I was able to even see his tombstone yesterday and just remarked of uh, his life and his ministry. And I stood over his tomb and I just thought, man, I want to have that godly life. I want it to see. And so the question we might ask is, uh, how does one get a godly life? What's the secret sauce to a godly life? What, does, what makes one mature in their Christian life? You're here today in this room because part of you wants to grow in your Christian life. You want to mature you want to hopefully stay the same. You want to grow into Christ's likeness. The question is, well, how does that happen? And this morning, uh, I want you to uh, have a godly life. I want you to be the godliest person other people know. I want them to see you and see that you've been with Jesus. Jesus makes it clear that he has a life that you and I should want. It's Matthew 16 says, if you try to hang on to your life, you'll lose it. 
But if you give up your life for my sake, you will save it. It's this upside down reality we live in. That, that the life you want is the life God has. That the thing you're looking for, the life you're looking for is something that only God can give. But if we're honest this morning, sometimes we don't feel transformed. You don't feel life in you at times. You you have doubts. You don't feel like you're the godliest person you know. You ask the question, well, why do I struggle with fear so much? Why, why do I, I struggle with negative thoughts that impact my Christian experience? You, you wonder, man, I, I wish I was more transformed, more godly than I am today. This morning, I want our text to illustrate for us three essentials for the life you want. The life of transformation, the godly life. That Billy and other people you know, maybe a grandparent or a mom or a dad had. And Romans 12, 1 and 2 really outlines that for us this morning. So this morning we're going to see the three essentials for the life you want. And join with me as I read verses 1 and 2 this morning. It says, I appeal to you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God... To present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Father, this morning we come to the text and we want to live the life you've called us to live. We want your will in our life. So Lord, may we submit and surrender to your word. May it be the authority that governs our life today. In your name we pray. Amen. The first essential this morning from our text is that Surrender is maturity, control is immaturity. You've got to choose surrender. If you're going to grow in your Christian experience and be this godly transformed person, you've got to get your mind around this aspect of surrender. But quite honestly, it's hard for Americans to do this. There's something that's wound so tight in our psyche that we love to argue about the power we have. We use language like personal agency. And we use language like autonomy. And we say things like, I can do whatever I want. Or we say things like, I can say whatever I want to say. And there's, there's put within us from being a part of this beautiful, wonderful country that I love, This independent sort of, I have my rights and no one's going to take them away. And while our rights are good and profitable and great, the text tells us your rights actually have to be laid down before the foot of the cross. That that Christian maturity is actually a life of surrender. Of presenting, the word is presenting your bodies, every part of you, as a living sacrifice to God. You, the sacrificial language is kind of old school for us, but in the Old Testament, this connects. See, uh, an animal that was holy and acceptable, meaning it was blameless, or it didn't have spots or it was the best sort of lamb or sacrifice one could have. They would take it and sacrifice on behalf of their sins for the community and for their own sin. And and the Apostle Paul, who wrote this section of Scripture under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, he's picking up on this sacrificial language. 
The difference between the Old Testament sacrificial system and what he's talking about is the lamb oftentimes didn't know it was going to be sacrificed. Romans, or Isaiah 53 says a lamb that doesn't know it's going to be slaughtered. The difference between you and I is we are not blindly sacrificing ourselves. We're fully knowing we are doing that. Like, you've got to have a conscious decision, I'm laying my life down. I'm presenting everything I am to Jesus. I'm not holding back anything. I'm not giving him compartmental issues of my life. Like, like we oftentimes think of our lives in these compartments of my church life, my work life, my family life. And what Jesus is saying uh, through his word is he's saying, I want all of you. All of those compartments, I want to infuse and inhabit everything. And then he says that this is your actual spiritual act of worship, is laying your life down. If you're going to grow in maturity, it's going to come at the cost of you losing control, releasing control, and surrendering to Jesus. Uh, Craig Rochelle says it this way, you don't always have the power to control but you always have the power to surrender. Man, man, I, I want to control my kids. I want to control what happens to me in my work situation. If COVID told us anything, is we literally have no control. We can all be shut down in a moment. Our lives, our jobs could be over and we could be laid off. Like we literally have really not a lot of control at all. And so oftentimes we, we try to, the power struggle to control our lives and to manipulate and, and, and work it as we should. And, and we have this ambition to like control every aspect of our life. And quite honestly, we don't have really that much control if we're honest. And we never usually have the power always to control. But I love what he says, you always have the power to surrender. You always have the power to lay down and say, God, I don't know what you're doing in my life right now, but uh, my life is yours. And in that is this spiritual act of worship. I love the story of the teenage girl, Mary, in the Bible. You know, Jesus' mom. <laughs> Where God comes to her and tells her some crazy stuff. She's going to have a baby without ever being with a man. <laughs> she, she realizes ultimately she has no control over the situation. And at the end, after the angel appears to her, after all this massive uh, um, sort of like revealing in her life, she says this, Behold, I am the servant of the Lord. Let it to me according to your word. That sounds awful light like surrender to me. It's not control, like I got to figure this out. It's okay, God, whatever you want, I'm laying it down before you. And one author anonymously says it this way, the main problem with a living sacrifice is that it keeps crawling off the altar. <laughs> We're living sacrifices. We don't like the altar because there's pain there. There's a sense of powerless. There's a sense of I'm giving up control. But as I started with, if you want to gain your life, you have to lose it. You've got to surrender it. And in that, you pick up this full orb sense of what God is doing in your life. It's like puzzle pieces. Imagine where a puzzle where pieces represent the parts of your life. When we surrender our lives to God, we're, we're, we're handing him all the pieces of our life. And he takes them and he places them exactly as they belong and he creates this beautiful masterpiece with our life. But when we hold back and refuse to surrender some of those puzzle pieces, it makes the puzzle incomplete and it lacks harmony. Today I wonder if your life is lacking some harmony, some, some peace. The, the challenge or the call to you is, to not try to figure out and control the situation, it's actually to surrender down. God, God, you're at work in my life. 
You're the one that can bring about harmony with the puzzle pieces that I don't even know what's happening in my life. And so first essential today is to surrender is your maturity. Control is immaturity. You've got to choose surrender. The second is essential is this, that Christian maturity is being comfortably uncomfortable. Expect change. As a Christian, you're called to be uncomfortable. Um, there's this kind of thing with my wife and I where she asked me to go buy this dining room table, which I did. But on the way out the door, I saw this very comfortable looking recliner chair for $45. And I had a decision to make. Do I ask if I can bring this home? Or do I just load it up and hope for the best? <laughs> Pastor Tay, you know what your boy did? <laughs> I was like, it's $45. Let's, let's load it up. And so it's this ongoing story in my home that um, this very ugly piece of lazy boy furniture, as my wife would say, uh, she even says it looks like an old man died in this chair. <laughs> and she's actually covered it with, you know, the, the, the like material from Amazon, buy this cover or whatever. I love this, I love this recliner. It, it hugs your neck, Louie. It, it like comes around and just... It's just, you pull it up, you got the, the chair, lit. I mean, it's just, I love it. Sunday afternoon, I will probably be on this chair. It's comfortable. It's, you can take a nap in it. Here it is. The spiritual life you want is not found in a lazy boy chair. It's just not. You are called to that which is uncomfortable. The, the word there is transformation. We're, we get the word metamorphosis. That, that's the original language, and, and we use that language around uh, what happens to a caterpillar, where a caterpillar will actually uh, change from one state to the next state, from a caterpillar to a butterfly, and it's a beautiful transformation, but that's the language that it's talking about here is, is you and I are not to be conformed to the world, but actually be transformed. By the renewing of your mind. This word transformed is only also seen in one other place in scripture. The other place is actually where Jesus was on top of the mountain with his disciples. We call this the moment of transfiguration. It's this profound moment where Jesus displays his godness in this really enormously profound glorious sight for the disciples, and they don't even know what to do. They stumble over their words, and they're trying to build tents in the middle of this enormously beautiful reveal. But, but Jesus was transformed from this, this human God state to this supernatural like being that shone, and they literally dropped down and worshiped him. He was so bright on top of that mountain. What, what Jesus is calling you and I to do is that transformed life of going from one state to to the next. And I'll call you here today that, that you can't experience that transformation unless you per, first put your faith in Jesus Christ. You can't do the transformation on your own. You don't have the power, you don't have the resources to do that. And so what, what he says is, is, is when I take the step of faith, as Caleb prof, 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 professed today, that, that he came and he, he said, I, I've committed my life to Jesus, Jesus has indwelt him, and now you go through this process of transformation. And, and the, the uncomfortability is like, you and I are part of the world's culture, and yet we're told to be separate from it. Be in it, but not of it. And that's just hard. That's uncomfortable. That is no lazy boy recliner. And even more so, as our day and age where there's more darkness, it seems like, where people are moving farther away from Scripture and farther away from uh, biblical principles, it's going to be even more uncomfortable at your work, at the places you play, at the places you eat, at the places you have friends. It's, it's farther spanning the, the gap and the tension 
the, the uncomfortability you and I face is that we are to show a degree which believers say in the second world would be trapped. We're, we're, we're not to be trapped in the world, but we're still supposed to be witnesses to it. So you're going to find yourself in intention. You're going to find yourself uncomfortable. The word transformation is literally mean change. What, what God is going to do in you is he's going to change you. If you're going to be like the Billy Graham or the godliest person you know, it's, you're going to have to go through some periods of a caterpillar to a butterfly, some transformation. And the way in which God often does that is through making our circumstances really uncomfortable. God is more concerned about your conformity to his will than he is to change of your circumstance. This is hard. That, that God's goal is you to be conformed in the likeness of Jesus. To be the godly person you desire, it means to conform to the likeness of Jesus. And the tool in the tool bag he often used is sometimes some hard circumstances. Because here it is, the hard circumstances are where it forces you to say, I've got no idea how this is going to work. I have to surrender my life to Jesus. Again and again, I have to present my body as a living sacrifice. And in that moment, Jesus looks down and says, okay, now I can work with you. Now you can have this aura, the ethos of you've been with me. But, but quite honestly, we ask God, God, take away the circumstance. We pray, God, remove the circumstance. And, and the circumstance, he may do that. But maybe in our maturity of our faith, we actually ask God, use the circumstance to conform me to the likeness of Jesus. See, that's a, a deeper, heartier prayer. It's asking for the thing God wants out of you already, which is conformity to Christ's likeness, to this godly life. And so I would tell you, don't waste a good crisis. <laughs> don't waste the difficulty. It's, it's hard because it's uncomfortable, but the Christian life is uncomfortable. Expect the change, the transformation, the caterpillar to the butterfly is going to happen in your life. And so the second essential is Christian maturity is being comfortably uncomfortable. You and I must expect change. Third and final essential the text outlines is the way in which the transformation happens is linked to the renewal of your mind. This is the third essential. Your mindset dictates your maturity. You've got to think rightly. Your mindset dictates your maturity. The life we have is a reflection of the thoughts we think. God, God I want to have the big Graham life. I want to have the godly life. I want people to see that, that not just for me, but that I'm walking with him, that I've been with him. And if you're sitting here and you're like, man, there's some compartments of my life that still need some transformation... What we can draw the line back to is maybe some wrong thinking, some mindsets that need some makeover in your life. Your transformation may be suffering because of your mindset. Maybe it's, it's toxic thinking. Maybe it's just negative thoughts that you think. I know there's so many times where if there's an optimistic thought, or a negative thought, it's just easier to dwell on the negative thought. I'm not good enough. I'm not strong enough, smart enough. I can't do it. And you just fill your mind with the negativity, and that shortcuts the transformation the text is talking about. You and I have the most conversation in a day, not with another person, but with ourselves. There's this inner dialogue of self-doubt we replay lies maybe we were told as a kid on the playground. We replay lies of things that aren't even true of Scripture, but we believe them 
because the lies of the enemy have invaded our mind. And we ruminate on them. And we ruminate in what the scripture is saying. We have to have to have a brainwash of that toxic, negative mindset. Proverbs 23, 7, it says this. As a person thinks in his heart, so is he. You win or lose the battle in your mind, church. It starts there. The godly life laid out for you is you've got to start winning consistent battles in the mind. I'm not a brain scientist by any means, but I did some very uh, light research this week. And, and there's these things called neuropathways. And their neuropathways are these, these uh, lanes that run in your brain. And there's, there's millions of them in your brain. And what happens is there's this thing called dopamine, which is a satisfying uh, thing that happens in your life. When, when you fall in love, there's a dopamine hit. When you're on Instagram or Facebook and someone likes or comments on your post, there's this like dopamine hit. And, and the desire is like you want to feel that again. And as you keep doing that thing, it builds a deeper and deeper rut in your brain so that you have to keep doing that. And, th- and this is where addiction can set in. Where it's like, I have to have that because i got to feel that feeling again and again. And uh, it's like a, a walkway on grass where you just keep walking on the same route on grass. And ultimately the grass begins to get trampled on and it becomes dead. And, and what the scriptures are saying to renew the neural pathways in your brain, you've got to stop that trajectory of thinking of negative thoughts of anxious mind of of a fear-bent mindset and say I've got to trust and surrender and believe that God is good in my life that he's walking with me that the scriptures brainwash me in a right way of thinking and my new dopamine hit is when I feel the fullness of God in my life the transformation that I'm looking for the Billy Graham-ness if you will and 2 Corinthians 10 says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war according to the flesh. Meaning, uh, though we walk as humans, we don't wage war as humans do. It says this, For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. Some of our mental thinking are strongholds we've got to tear down goes on, we destroy arguments and lofty opinions raised against the knowledge of God. There's a competing knowledge of God for the neural pathways in your brain. And the enemy, the spiritual darkness in this world, he wants you to ruminate on the wrong type of thinking. But here it is. We take every thought captive to obey Christ. How do we take down the strongholds? You take every thought captive. And you submit it and surrender it to obey God. And then you'll see your life continually be transformed from the caterpillar to the butterfly. How, how do we get our mind renewed? It's, it's not hard. It's soaking your mind in right thinking. You don't have an appetite for God's word. You're going to starve your mind. And you're going to believe and hear all the other things, the world and people and your past and the the wrong thoughts people have said against you, they're going to invade. And and what you and I have to do is we have to gain more scripture. You've got to have the appetite of the word of God renewing you. So what are we going to do, church? What are we going to do to be the godly person is we're going to choose surrender. Surrender. Not control, we're going to choose to surrender. We're going to know that the Christian life is uncomfortable and expect change, even circumstances that know that they will be the cause to help us depend and surrender to God. And then third is we need to think rightly. We need to renew our mind. I told you I was at the Billy Graham Library yesterday and went through uh, the museum and one of his preaching Bibles was there 
And it, it was like captivated to me because I was like, wow, I want to see this Billy Graham's Bible he preached out of. And I took a picture of it, and he was notes all around the outside edges. You can see some of his handwriting there. And there's this line. It's uh, John chapter 3 is where the page that's opened up. And there's this line, and at the top left, he has uh, these words. He says, Two elements in the new birth, water of the word and the conviction of the Holy Spirit. If you're going to renew your mind and walk this godly life, it's got to be the water of the word, soaking your mind in the word of God. And it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit that lives in you, that Christ, the hope of glory, lives in you. That the the same spirit that raised Christ from the dead lives in you, children of God. And you can stand and believe that and walk in that. Uh, on the way out the door at the museum, Billy Graham is said to have studied at Florida Bible Institute. And he met this man, Judson Van Deventer. And this man heavily influenced Billy's preaching. This man, Deventer, he actually coined and wrote the lyrics to the song, I Surrender All. And it impacted Billy Graham so much so that throughout the crusades of the 1930s and 40s, Billy Graham actually used I Surrender All as the closing song where he would call thousands and millions of people to respond to the message of hope in the gospel. The song says this, all to Jesus I surrender All to him I freely give. I will ever love and trust him in his presence daily live. All to Jesus I surrender. Humbly at his feet I bow. Worldly pleasures all forsaken. Take me, Jesus. Take me now. I surrender all. I surrender all. All to thee, my blessed Savior. I surrender all. Well, I'm not like Pastor Tay. I can't sing that. But I do have someone, Kayla. Kayla, can you just sing a cappella over us that song, I Surrender All? I surrender. I wonder if you today want to start again, to surrender your life again. It's a continual thing you must do every day to present your bodies as living sacrifices to God. So would you stand with me right now? And there's something about the posture of our body connects to the posture of our heart. And would you just put your hands out like this with me? And just for 30 seconds, in your own words to God, pray a prayer of surrender to him. Maybe if so you've never trusted in Jesus or never surrendered your life to him, today is a great day. Just simply say, God, I'm surrendering my life to you. So just in this moment right now, don't let it pass. God wants you to walk the godly life. Pray in your own words with your hands open, I surrender now again to you. Father, we're your people. Today, we don't choose control or power. We choose surrender. And we lay our lives before you as sacrifices, asking you to do the work in and through us. God, we want to be this transformed life. So 
continue to help us renew our mind as we soak on the scriptures. God, would we walk the new life in fullness and thrive in this Christian experience. God, we know you love us. Thank you for this church. In your name we pray.
Christ, our Savior. Thank you that we, your people, have the Word of God. Thank you that we have the body of Christ to spur us on, to bring a change in our lives. And Lord, today, we put a new foot in front of the other and say, Lord, for you and your glory, for your purpose, use us as instruments in the Redeemer's hand. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you be so kind, have a seat for just a moment. Uh, we, we're out a little early, so I'm going to take about five more minutes. Uh, that sermon was so moving, I want to preach again. So open up your Bibles to Romans 12. <laughs> I mean, come on, Pastor. Thank you for the word. Uh, real quick, we've, uh, we have an elder candidate uh, that I want to bring uh, to our congregation here. And then we'll kind of uh, share some next steps. Uh, but what our elders do here at Gospel of Life Church is they guard the doctrine in which we, uh, which we operate by, uh, as well as discipleship within our church, right? We should be growing and going in the right direction. And then that's the last one, is that our elders make sure we are moving in the right directions. Let me read to you 1 Peter uh, chapter 5, verses 1 through 5, real quickly. And it says this, So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ and as well as a partaker of the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourself, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And so I'm going to invite Dave Erickson in the room. Actually, Dave and Laura, why don't you come on up? Uh, Dave has now been on our elder track. Uh, elder candidate, we want to pre present to you. For the last six months, months Dave has set in with our elders uh, it seemed as if in that moment the chemistry has been building, uh, the character and his conduct has been there. And so today we want to uh, present to him as a candidate to us. And so we're going to ask him a couple questions and then we'll leave. I'll have Anthony close out in prayer after that. But Dave and his wife, Laura, I just gave it away. But tell us a little bit about your family and then we'll ask a couple questions. Yeah. You know, first of all, very humbled and honored to be up here. Um, this is my wife. First, my name's Dave. Uh, this is my wife, Laura. Uh, we've been married coming up 19 years next All month. Right. And um, Laura just loves the Lord, and she loves me, and I'm so grateful for her. Um, we've got three kids. Uh, Jacob is a freshman. He just started uh, driving. All right. For him. Uh, he's a freshman <laughs> over at Wheaton Academy. Uh, he's 15. And then Audrey's 13, seventh grader, and then Mason's a fifth grader. And so just, just blessed to have a wonderful family and grateful. Amen. Yep. Amen. Well, as I said, you've been sitting on our elders meeting, learning the culture and your character uh, from our leaders who lead in the church have been uh, well before you as well. When you think about this elder role, what energizes you most about stepping into this role here at Gospel Life? Yes, we've been attending Gospel Life for about six years and um, really seen our faith grow tremendously over those six years. Um, Laura and I were baptized together about five years ago, and uh, we saw each of our three kids being mm. baptized um, at Gospel Life. And so seeing that growth in faith as we look back, uh, just really feel called to, to lead and give back to the church and feel, to answer your question, feel energized to um, serve and lead at church that's so laser focused on mission and values mm -hmm. and that, that energizes me. Mm. Amen. Yeah. Dave, what do you bring to our elder team as we do those three things? We guard the doctrine, uh, we make sure we're growing in the right direction of discipleship and then our church is moving in the right direction. What do you bring to our elder team? Yeah. Yeah, as I think back on my faith journey, I, I think about my, my gifts mm. and my, my top spiritual gifts are discernment, um, hospitality and wisdom and then I think about my natural gifts I think about um, critical thinking problem solving uh, listening business acumen and so when I think about those natural and spiritual gifts I really feel like I can add value to the elder board and 
and also leading the church. So I look forward to using those gifts. Amen. Yeah. Well, thank you for submitting to this journey. Dave is a good man. I've been in a small group with this guy for now, what, three years or so. Uh, I think to that last question, I think we all want to know, uh, wisdom, discernment, are you north side or south side baseball? Yeah. <laughs> this is important to our eldership. Choose wisely. We're all sinners here. <laughs> Uh oh. Uh, I'm a North Sider and. Hey, we'll take that. We'll, we'll Baseball go, season, we'll friends. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, we love you. Here's what's going to happen next, friends. Um, uh, May 19th, we are going to affirm and vote as a congregation. But what you have is over the next 30 days, uh, as a member of our uh, fellowship, as a congregation, if you feel uh, there's any concerns or uh, maybe things are not in good standing, you have the opportunity to come to, uh, uh, come to our elders uh, as, as a conversation and work through those uh, discussions as well. Then after that, on May 19th, we'll vote and affirm. And then later this summer, we will install uh, Dave as an elder here at Gospel Life Church. And so uh, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to ask Anthony uh, Monero, who serves as our elder, to come and pray for uh, Dave and Laura and send them out God's blessing. Join me in standing, and then we'll be, uh, we'll leave. Join me in prayer. Father, we just thank you for your word. We thank you that you call each of us to be transformed. And we thank you, Father, for the transformation that you are working uh, in each of our lives. We thank you, Lord, for just raising up Dave and Laura, for bringing them to gospel life. Father, for the growth that uh, you have been working in their lives. Mm -hmm. Father, we pray that your blessings upon them. We pray, Father, that you would uh, just guide this congregation, Father, to take uh, steps of faith as you call us to. Father, help us to surrender all that we have to you as we just sang um, all of it before you, all of it we lay at your feet. And uh, death is just a doorway to resurrection life. Yeah, that's right. God, that uh, we are called to be living sacrifices. Lord, let us go forth and do that this week. We lift these things up to you in your name. Amen. Amen. May God bless you, keep you, enjoy your week. We'll see you next week.